afternoon. How is everyone's DEF CON going? So this talk is on backdooring the front door. Um, and it got a lot of slides, so I'm just going to get right into it. So to start off, I'm J Max. I work as a software engineer, um, hacker for fun, like doing things with locks. And the thing I always like to tell people is the best puzzles are the ones that were never meant to be solved. And I think that explains a lot about the hacker attitude. Um, now, all opinions expressed in this talk are my own. They aren't my past, present, or future employers' opinions. And if you see something you like and you want to reach out later, um, you can find me on Twitter, um, at JMAX. So obviously this talk is going to be about the Internet of Things. Oh. And we just lost video. There we go. Internet of Things. Um, so our homes are getting smarter and we're bringing more technology into our homes to replace traditionally dumb or mechanical um, objects. And for this talk, we're going to be looking at the August lock, particularly the August smart lock uh, that I have upstate on stage here. This is what an August lock looks like when you put it on your door. Um, I don't know if you can see it on the screens up there, but it replaces the thumb term on your deadbolt. So if you live in an apartment like me, this is a great option because you don't actually have to replace the outside of your, your lock. That would annoy your landlord. Um, and the device itself is just Bluetooth low energy, um, and it gives you smart lock features like auto unlocking, unlocking when you approach the door, uh, those type of things. But why the, what got me interested in this lock was actually August's marketing team. One of the things I like to do when I'm looking at a technology is see what claims the company distributing it is making. Now, on August's website, the quotes up that I'm showing you up here, um, they're actually no longer on their website. You can find them on the Wayback Machine. Um, but they said such things as, uh, their lock is unlike physical keys, which can be duplicated and distributed without your knowledge. They also said, it's safer than codes that can be copied. And so we get this reoccurring theme that it's not like a traditional key. It's somehow safer. And their most um, aggressive claim, I'm going to let them explain it to you because I don't think you would believe me if I told you. August is the lock that requires no key, only an invitation. An invitation that you can give and take away whenever you please. Keyless, codeless, and completely secure. And completely secure. Completely secure, and completely secure, and completely secure. So I didn't just loop that video for the hell of it. Um, that's actually what I did when I first heard this piece of marketing material. I went back to that YouTube video and just played that section over and over again, thinking I must have misunderstood something. Um, because I'm sure what they're trying to do is comfort people and say, oh, we know it's technology, but it's safe technology. And their thought was, this will make people feel comfortable with our lock and think it's secure. However, that's not really how I took it at all. I kind of took this as, well, you have a completely secure lock. Sure, it would be worth looking into, I suppose. I don't think I've ever seen a completely secure lock. So putting together the security claims. Obviously, they claim perfect security, which is a little amorphic. Uh, but they also claim things like guest access can be revoked at any time. Guest have permissions can be limited to a schedule. Guests can't use the unlock feature. They can't access lock settings. They can't see who's using the lock. Um, and the keys can't be duplicated. We saw that claim twice in two different forms. So they said co their codes can't be deep. They don't have codes that can be copied, and they don't have keys that can be duplicated. Um, they also say that you can track who enters and exits your home. Uh, that should say home, not phone. So to start looking at the lock, I said, I'm going to map out the API. I work as a software engineer. Um, ju let's just look at the boundaries of this application. Let's approach it black box. But the problem is which API? There's actually two APIs in the August lock. There's the one between your phone and the lock, and the one between your phone and the cloud. Or if you read XKCD, someone else's computer. Um, and working as a software engineer, mostly on web applications, I wanted to look at that HTTP one first, the REST side. So what I did is I downloaded MTM Proxy, and if you're not familiar with this tool, you really should get familiar with it. It's an awesome tool, super easy to use to get in the middle of any application, particularly if they're using SSL. Um, so I installed the certificates on my phone, 
fire up MTM proxy and launch the application. And I get something that looks like this. And what this is indicating is that the August application is using certificate pinning. Now, if you're a developer and you develop mobile apps, certificate pinning is a really good idea, and you should absolutely have it on, on your applications. However, if you're a hacker and you're trying to figure out how something works, it's a real pain in the ass. So we need a way around this. One solution is to use iOS kill switch. Um, it's originally developed by ISEC partners. Um, there's a new version, iOS kill switch 2. Basically what it does is shut off certificate validation on your iPhone. Now, b this being a DEF CON talk, I really didn't want to walk in and shut off SSL on my phone and then connect to the DEF CON Wi-Fi and see what happened. I don't think that would work out well for me. So I need a better solution. Fortunately, August built one into their application. If you just tap on the hamburger, press and hold on the version number, and then you type the super secret phrase, dreadful DAO, casing matters, make sure your Ds are capital, you'll get access to their debug menu. On their debug menu, at the very top, you'll see a URL. That URL is the endpoint that their application's talking to when it reaches out to the cloud. If you just tap on that, it pulls up this menu. Now, I obviously don't want to look at staging in their development environments because, well, that's probably outside of scope and I don't really want any nasty letters from, from August. But this other option looks pretty cool. So if you just tap on that, it opens another dialog where you can specify any endpoint you want. Now, obviously, if you can specify any endpoint you want, they can't have pinned the certificate for every endpoint in the world. So I just enter an endpoint I control, and it can be HTTP or HBS, so you can choose not to deal with HTTPS at all if you want to. Enter a URL you control, hit custom, the application will crash, and when it relaunches, boom, you're in the middle. So now we have access to all the traffic back and forth, and we can start looking at how the application works. And one key thing I'd like to point out here is unlike iOS kill switch, SS, or sorry, SSL kill switch, uh, this didn't require a jailbreak. There's no jailbreak required. This could be a stock phone and this would work. And being a developer, um, thought occurred to me, there's probably a sprint review where some developer walked in the room and was just like, I've implemented certificate pinning. We're good. Ship the perfect security claim. So we're gonna cross that out. Now obviously after we map out the API, we can build up a collection. I use Postman, put together a collection of all the endpoints that it talks to. Uh, this collection will be available in the GitHub repository after this talk. Now looking through all the APIs that the August application uses, one of them caught my interest, and that was this one. And for those who can't see what's on the screen, it's the mobile application telling August's servers that you just unlocked your lock. And this is the owner of the lock doing it. And what's interesting here is it's not anonymous. This is tied to your account. So what August is doing is they're building up a collection of every time you've entered or exited your house if you're the owner of the lock. This is something your schlag and your dumb locks are not going to do. Um, it's a little creepy. I'm not sure I want a company that makes a lock that they can open, also being, also being able to build a profile of when I'm home and when I'm not home. Those two sets of data together would be incredibly valuable on the black market. So let's fix this. MTM proxy can actually modify traffic as well as just listening to it. So with a little script, we just intercept all the APIs that log data about locking and unlocking, and we tell the application, yeah, 200, everything's good, and we don't tell the web servers anything. And the nice thing about this is it gives us privacy, but if we remember, they made the claim that you'll know when your guests open your door. Well, the way they know that guests open your door is the mobile application logs to their server, hey, I just opened this door, and then they notify you, um, Jimmy opened your door. Um, obviously, if you can just say, I'm not going to tell you when I open a door, that kind of defeats that feature. But they also said, um, guests can't be notified or know the, see the activity of feed of a lock. Well, it turns out if we look at this, this, this API, there's an API to set notifications. So when someone opens your door, it's supposed to notify you and say, um, someone opened your door, someone locked your door. Um, and if we just specify any lock, it could be a lock you don't own. Um, and any user identified by their phone number or their email address, and we say, notify me when this user opens this lock. It doesn't matter what the lock is or what the user is, August will dutifully notify you that that user opened the lock, even if you don't own that lock, 
even if you're not a guest on that lock, any lock in the world. But what else can we do? Well, August has this idea of owners and guests, or as they like to call them, users and super users. But guests are supposed to be limited in what they can do. Specifically, they're not supposed to be able to use things like the auto unlock feature, and they're not supposed to be able to change lock settings. But how does the mobile application know when you're an owner and when you're a guest? Well, it's actually this message right here. They say user type, user. And if it's user type, user, you're a guest. If it's super user, you're an admin. So let's just use MTM proxy again, and we'll just replace user with super user, and we get access to the menu as a guest. So this is the first big interesting discovery we have here, which is the lock itself has no concept of owner and guest. It only knows about users. The entirety of the access control model is implemented server-side and in the application. And since they're relying on you to talk to the server, well, we can just cut that out eventually. So to the claim that guests can't do these things, I just have to say that's wrong. Guests can absolutely do them. They may not be able to do them through your application, but they can do them. So now the list of claims looks something like this. Less gray and more red, but I think we can do more. We only looked at one side of the API right now. What about that Bluetooth side? Now, in case you forgot, it's structured like this. The lock itself has no Wi-Fi. It relies on your phone to talk to the cloud. So if you want to play with Bluetooth low energy, a good app to start with is Light Blue. It's great for enumerating services and just seeing what um, Bluetooth low energy looks like. Um, and you'll get something like this. So this is an August lock. And because we were able to connect to it and pull services from the thing, we know that we're able to pair it with it, which means it must just be using it just works pairing because I never had to enter a pin. Um, but August relies on a second layer of encryption, so that's not too big of a deal. But I would like to intercept some traffic, and if you look at Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy long enough, you're eventually going to run across the Uber tooth, which is supposed to make this really easy. Unfortunately, I didn't think it was that easy, and after about a week, I said, well, this is too hard, and I need to find something else. But again, there's a better solution. It's built into the August application again. <laughs> if we go back to the previous menu, there's this Send Logs button. If we just tap that, it'll pull up a screen that looks like this. And for those who can't read it in the back of the room, it's to auto-unlock at august.com. Now, if, like me, you look at that title and say, I wonder if this will auto-unlock my lock, um, I hate to disappoint you, it won't. What it will do is get you an email from their VP of engineering asking why you just sent this to them. <laughs> but what I'm going to do is just replace that with my email address to avoid those emails. Then once I get on my computer, I open it up in Notepad++, and I search for ciphertext. And what you know, on the left side of the screen is the ciphertext for the communication between the phone and the lock, and on the right side of the screen is the plain text. So man in the middle attack built into the application. So that Uber tooth I bought, completely useless, throw it out, I just need their mobile app. And again, no jailbreak is required to do any of this. Um, in particular for the Bluetooth logs, if you just use August support instead of dreadful DAO, you'll just get the send, the send logs button and it'll work just as well. So now that we have the Bluetooth, how, does, how do they authenticate with the lock? Now, it's fairly simple. Um, again, all access control is on the web server. So when your phone connects to the lock, uh, your phone then generates 64 bits of random data. They send that 64 bits to the web server. The web server encrypts it into a packet to be sent to the lock. Your phone gets it from the web server and then hands it off to the lock. The lock is able to decrypt it and then hand, generate its own 64 bits, hand it back to your, your phone. Your phone can't decrypt it, so it hands it to their server. And then their server hands it back to you, decrypted. And you take those two things, you glue them together, and that gives you a session key. And then you just use AES and that session key, and now you can talk to the lock. Now, what's interesting here is you'll notice this is all symmetric encryption, which means the web server and the lock must have the same key. So how did they get that key onto the lock? One option is, is burnt in at the factory, and there's absolutely no way to pull it out. Another option would be maybe it's flashed in with the firmware. So 
let's request firmware as a guest. So as a guest user, I request access to, I request a copy of the firmware. And to make it interesting, I'll request firmware that doesn't exist. And I get a response that looks like this. And at the bottom of that request, just a normal 404 for a piece of firmware that doesn't exist, I see the serial number of my lock and then a bunch of garbage. That garbage looks awful suspicious. Why is there garbage in HTML? So if we open that up in a hex editor, and we just start walking through this and trying random series of bits and just skip the obviously wrong ones, like the all zero sections, we'll come across the, the highlighted one. And that decrypts the packets that were sent to the web server. So now we know that must be the key that's being used. This key I'll call the firmware key. I think August internally calls it the online key, but I think firmware key is more accurate in this case. Um, so this key appears to be unique for every lock, but with this key we're actually able to emulate the web server. Now the way August works is there's actually 256 key slots in each of these locks. Uh, key slot zero is this key, the firmware key. Now if we go back to their claims, they said it's safer than codes that can be copied and it's unlike physical keys that can be duplicated or distributed without your knowledge. Well, I didn't have any problems copying and pasting it. So <laughs> duplication seems to work. I also didn't have any problems distributing it because you all have it now. <laughs> so this silver lock, if anyone tries to sell this to you on eBay, it is worth nothing. But it actually goes further. If we take those log files we got earlier, I need to stop touching this HDMI cable. If we take those log files we got earlier and we just run grep on them, um, looking for some interesting stuff, we can pull a lot out of there. We can actually pull all the offline keys. We can pull all the usernames, passwords, um, the firmware key, the JWT tokens that are used to talk to the web server. So basically all the secrets. So that log file not only contains all the Bluetooth traffic, but it also contains everything you need to talk to the web server. Now I think most of these are fixed at this point, um, but you'll probably still be able to pull offline keys from, from those logs. So now the list looks a little bit more like this. Not so hot. So the moral of the story here is, with a smart lock, don't give access to someone you wouldn't give a key to. Because in spite of what the vendor claims, it behaves much more like a traditional pin and tumbler system where when you hand someone a key, they can do anything with that lock, then it behaves like your G a email you sent through Gmail or something like that. Um, it behaves like a physical key. If you give someone guest access to one of these locks, assume they, they can get permanent access. So all the code after um, this talk will be published on GitHub. There's the address. Um, I'll tweet it out after this as well. So I think we're, we're doing good on time, actually. Much faster live. Um, so I'm going to do um, a couple demos here. So obviously I have two locks here. There's a bunch of wires coming out of them, so you probably won't trust anything I do with them. Um, so we're going to be using a new lock that's never been associated with an account. And, but before I switch them out, I want to show you something. So if we look at this silver lock here, and we just go to settings, and we go down to the bottom, I don't know if everyone can see the version of software that lock happens to be running. It's safe to say that is not factory firmware, which means that the code being pushed to these locks is unsigned. So the lock itself could be running any code because it doesn't have any signature checking um, to make sure that the code came from August. But now let's, uh, we're, I'm gonna switch that lock out and uh, we're gonna do a demo. I'm just gonna unpower this one so I don't pick it up in the demo. So this is a brand new lock that's never been associated with any user's account and hopefully it's not DOA. Pull out the battery tab. OK, 
Okay, so we have a new lock on our door now. Fresh from the factory and right out of the box. In, in its perfectly secure state. Okay, let's add this to our account. So we're just gonna go in here and set up a new lock. If you have the August application, don't try to beat me to this. There we go. We'll name it Front Door since that's the name of this talk. And we'll put it in our DEF CON house. And we'll go ahead and configure it. So to calibrate the lock, we just put it on our door, lock it, unlock it, sets up the lock. Okay, now we have a lock on our door. And it opens and closes as you can see. connects here. There we go. So there's our lock. Um, let's invite a guest user to this lock. So I'm just going to invite myself, another account. Um, and we can see on the front door, the access level is none. Let's just change that. We're just going to change that to guest. And it reminds us that guests can't use the auto unlock. They can't invite other guests. They can't control lock settings. A um, bunch of stuff we know probably isn't true. We'll just update that. Okay, so now we have a guest user. And you know what, let's go back and let's make sure that we have notifications turned on, and we do. Great, so we should be notified then every time uh, this user attempts to use this lock. Okay, let me just shut down the flashing lights demo here. There we go. And we're just going to run backdoor.js. Can't see? Okay, let me um, font size this. Um, does anyone know where the font size is? Thank you. The obvious answer is answer. Okay, so Atwood's law is in play here. Anything that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. So I figure if we're going to attack hardware, we might as well write the exploits in JavaScript. Um, so we can see the results here. It connected to the lock, added a backdoor, and then disconnected from the lock. Um, and if we go back to the other screen, we still have been notified that anything has happened. So we know we're connected to the lock. Let's. We, we know we backdoored the lock. Let's see if we can just cycle the lock. So I'm just gonna try to open and close the lock as that guest user. Thank you. So we're connected to the lock, and it should, there we go, start opening and closing. So we just made from a guest user, we added a backdoor to the lock, and now we're using that backdoor to open and close that, that lock. And if we go back and we look at the owner's phone, they still have been notified we used that lock. But what happens when we revoke access from that guest? So if I go to the guest and I, I'll just delete him altogether. I don't want him accessing any of my locks. It's gone. and we cycle the lock again, it should still work. To those in the back room, if you can see the lights on the lock, uh, they'll tell you when it's open and closing. Green is open, red is closed. So there we go, the lock is opening and closing. And they'll actually just keep going on forever. Um, we'll just disconnect from that. So plenty of time. So let's try the high risk demo here. What I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to factory reset this lock. 
So if I go back to the iPhone here, there's our lock. We'll issue a factory reset. So now that lock has been reset to factory state. And if we go back to our demo, let's do something else maybe. Let's go back to the lights. It should still connect up and still work. There we go. We, we established a connection, and now it's sending um, the light up. And the screen is, there we go. That'll make it better. But there's still the possibility that maybe August clears the keys when you add it back to your account. So let's just add it back to a user's account. Start setup, scan for locks. This part takes a while, apparently. There we go, front door. We'll actually add it to a different house. We'll just skip the calibration this time. Not too interested. Okay, so there's our lock again, and it still works. Um, but if we, let me close out of this, disconnect from it, okay. If we go back to our guest user, who was once a guest of this lock, the lock has been factory reset and it's been added to a new house. And we, we see if it still works using the back door we previously inserted. And again, what should happen here is it'll scan for the lock, it's gonna find the lock, connect to the lock, and then it's going to open and close it indefinitely. So the interesting thing here is if you bought one of these locks used off of eBay and you put it on your front door, the previous owner had access to it. The previous owner had the ability to assert an offline key and the previous owner now knows where you live. So again, it models much like a physical lock, just like buying a used pin and tumbler lock means that you have a key that someone else could have a copy of. Buying a used August lock means you have a lock that someone else could have a key for. So there's a bunch of mistakes made, obviously, um, in the August application. Um, there's, it logs sensitive data, uh, doesn't differentiate between guest and owners at the lock. It does that all remotely and at the application level. level. The firmware is not signed. There's no apparent way for a user to discover if their lock has been backdoored, um, but you actually don't even need to backdoor the lock because that firmware key is so, so central to the lock's um, operations. Um, the, the system relies on guests reporting when they open and close the lock, and the vendor makes claims that they have two-factor authentication when really they only have two-step authentication. There's a couple things that they fixed, and um, the final one, this one's really entertaining, is all the key material for the lock is not actually stored on the Apple keychain. So it's all just in a preference file. Um, so if you just look at your iOS backups, you can just pull keys for these things if you want. Um, but they've done a couple of things correctly. For the most part, they've been fairly responsive. Um, their application does use certificate pinning, which is pretty good. Um, and their protocol makes use of nuances. And this is important because they use CBC in the mode for their encryption. And if you know um, cryptography and AES, you'll know that um, with CBC, if you're using a null ID like they are, you can have repeat messages that can disclose what someone's doing. So the use of no ones is, is important. Additionally, they don't just rely on the Bluetooth low energies security mechanisms. Uh, they built in their own. So this brings me to my real point, which is why we need hackers, why we need security researchers because the security claims that vendors are making can't be validated by consumers. Consumers lack the expertise necessary to determine if these claims are valid, so they have to take the manufacturer's word for it. And what can be asserted without proof can also be dismissed without proof. And if a vendor isn't providing evidence of the claims of their security of their device, then we should assume that there is no security in that device. 
So that's that got through that pretty quick. So I will actually take questions. Um, there's a microphone in the front if anyone has any. That was really amazing. Thank you. Uh, I do have one burning question. Yes. How did you get the password that allowed you to uh, get into the debug mode of uh, the application? Sure. Um, so there's a couple ways you could do it. You could look at the iOS application and try to get the IPK off the, off the phone. Um, initially tried doing that, and reversing iOS apps is a little difficult, so I just download the Android app, and then it's <laughs> obvious. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, my name's David Rogers. I'm from the IoT Security Foundation. Um, so, fantastic work. Um, we're seeing this all over the place, in, particularly in consumer products that are going out. Uh, so this is an open invitation, really, to yourself and to everyone in this room. Um, we're reaching out to people to come and help us, because this stuff is absolutely shocking. You know, we've been through this in the mobile industry. Uh, we've fixed it time and again. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, all the stuff for the uh, iOS apps, you know, some of these consumer products companies have never uh, done anything like this before, or they're, they're creating minimal viable products and selling this stuff for crazy prices. So uh, let's just kind of stop it now and uh, come and help us. IoT Security Foundation. Thank you. How much were these, and can I get some? Because I the, want to play with them. Of the smart locks? Yes. Um, you can pick. So you can pick them up on eBay for maybe 150, the original <laughs> version. Outstanding. Um, if you want their latest revision, which most of this stuff still works on, um, you can get those for about 200, 220 new. And then obviously, again, look at eBay if you're researching security of the lock. Doesn't really matter. So buy it off of eBay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other question was, did they fix anything in the app or? Have, you know, if I go buy or download the app right now, did they fix anything in it? Or can you provide the unpatched version so we can play with it? Um, if you just um, download the iOS app today, you can still unlock that debug menu. And so the question was whether it was patched or not. So one of the key things here is the firmware side of it, right? Because we're using, uh, we're interac interacting with the lock directly from the computer here. Um, so one of the important things, and it's, on the debug menu there, let me show you it. Oh, and thank you. Is this disable over the air updates. Um, this is a really good feature if you want to look at these. And I recommend if you buy one, get it with factory firmware and check that box immediately. Um, you can also check it by modifying your iOS back backups. Um, but the reason why I want to check that is there's a UART on the device, and the factory firmware logs to UART, and every revision thereafter doesn't. Um, so keeping it at the stock firmware will give you a way in. Additionally, I'll be publishing um, all the code for this um, so that you can um, work with that as a base, and that'll get you connected to the lock. It'll take care of these security mechanisms, and it should let you uh, do some of the basic stuff yourself. Um, you can also use that to write an application that doesn't have the, the logging of when you open and close your lock if, if you care about your privacy. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I missed it, but was your future access to it because you rested that key zero, that firmware key, from the from the lock, and you said that was per lock? And have you seen an ability to change that so key zero at all? I have the ability to change it. I don't recommend people change it because it's high risk. You can brick a device by changing that, that key. If you change it to something and you change it um, to a value you forget <laughs> or you mess up while you're changing it and it ends up in some intermediate state, you end up in a world of hurt because that firmware key is the only one that can enroll new keys. Um, so it's a fairly high risk key to change. So the code I'll be publishing has a safety check in it. Um, so by default, it's not gonna let you do that, but it also has the ability to bypass that safety check so you can replace it. If you do replace that key, their application will stop to work on your device. Um, for what was involved in um, the back door I was showing, What's actually happening is I'm inserting this key, the one up on the screen, which no one can read. 
um, into key slot 200. And the reason I'm putting in key slot 200 is because the mobile application starts putting offline keys at key slot 1. And if you get their keypad device, it starts putting offline keys at key slot 255. So any number in the middle is going to survive for quite some time. So this is actually using a different mechanism to maintain access. So even if they rotate firmer keys on reset, unless they clear all offline keys, uh, this would still work. Thank you. I have two questions. So the first one, you showed that you had a modified firmware loaded on the thing. Did you yes. do anything with that, or was it just to show that they weren't signing it? Um, so in that one, the only modification act is actually the changing of the version number. Um, because the goal was just to show that sure. you can put custom firmware on it. Um, I didn't write a custom firmware to do anything interesting. Uh, okay. But obviously you could. Right. Uh, so the other question is, as far as I could tell from following your kind of narrative of the whole thing, if I were just walking around with light blue and I saw an August smart lock, none of the vulns that you had would be able to open it. I would have had to have already either bought it from somebody else and, and all that stuff, or given it to somebody else, or I'd have to already have guest access and then upgrade. Right. So everything I've, I've shown here will get you from guest um, to permanent access or near permanent access. The only one that didn't require any authorization was notification of when the lock is unlocked or locked. But in that scenario, you do need to know the owner's phone number or their email address. Um, and if you see the lock on their door, uh, it broadcasts the ID. In the um, light blue application, you can pull the lock ID um, off of it. And that's how it's identified in the system, and that remains the same no matter how many times it's reset. Cool. Thank you. So that's my talk. Um, the final I'll, I'll give you is if you want to play with the locks at all, Best Buy is a, a great place. Most of the locks at Best Buy at, aren't actually paired with an account. If you walk in, they have an August demo booth. Just fire up the August application and associate with your account, and it'll give you um, something you can play with on their APIs. One last question. Was there any indication that maybe the AES key was actually derived from the serial number? I don't have any evidence of that. Um, I don't know how it's generated. I'm assuming it's random, and it's probably using the same mechanism they use to generate offline keys. Um, I also don't think it's generated from the serial number, because you used to be able to enroll non-existent locks in their APIs. Um, and for those ones, it wouldn't hand you a key back. So there's probably a database somewhere uh, that has a table joining the lock ID and then the, um, the offline key, that's the, the firmware key. Great. Um, if you want to play with this, the IoT Village has a lock, um, a smart lock there. Uh, I'll be publishing um, this immediately hereafter and get, providing a link on, link on Twitter. Um, so you can take it over there and um, mess with their lock.